We're entering into a new time frame here from really the prehistoric and ancient world into what's known as the classical world, really the Greeks, the Romans, but also the Etruscans, etc. And we're focusing on the West, but of course there are other areas of the world that are flourishing as well. Remember, if one war goes a different way, we would have a culture probably based on the Persians as much as anything else. And in terms of timeline, while we've been dealing with Egypt, which crosses a lot of what we're dealing with, and the Minoans, which are much earlier, and the Mycenaeans, as we look at the Greeks, the Etruscans, and the Romans, they're all overlapping quite a bit. So we're going to have a lot of commonality between the three. That's why we look at them as the classical world. Now, as we move through, we have a number of things happening. In 1200, as we've talked about, we see the end of the Bronze Age, the Sea Peoples. By 550, the Greeks are developing, but there are a number of other people out there. The Hellas are the Greeks, but we have the Persians, the Lydians, which are sort of what's left of the Hittites, the Thracians and Illyrians up in Europe, the Etruscans in Italy, etc., the Phoenicians are still around, but they are shrinking. They're becoming less and less relevant. By 218, so we're right at the end of Greece and Rome is really developing, we see, again, vast changes. We see the old Hellenistic empires still there. Kingdoms are still there. We see Carthage, which won't be there for long. We see the Romans developing in Italy, having taken over the Etruscans and moving on. And Greece at this time in 218, even though they're about to fall within about 75 years or so, because of their holdings in the east, they effectively control Egypt and all that yellow area, which is the Seleucid uh, kingdoms. They're going to be really sort of the most powerful, more or less. But Rome is developing at that point. In terms of trade, by about 500 BCE, during the height, or just before the height of the Greek Empire, we see the Greeks and Phoenicians controlling trade, but there's an immense amount of trade throughout the area. And then we have the Silk Road coming in from the east, coming as far as Turkey and into parts of Europe. Those trade routes are going to be there for a while. And these trade routes are quite old, as old as 2000 BCE that we're seeing trade coming from Asia into Europe. All these people are well aware of each other. And this is where we get the Silk Roads coming in. And really the Silk Road is multiple roads. It's all the trade routes, sea-based and land-based that move from China and India into Europe, oftentimes crossing parts of Africa. Africa playing a huge role in those trade routes, but something that we just don't deal with much. So let's talk about religion, Greek religion. In terms of the gods, the gods start out as local gods, gods of cities, just like what we've seen in the past. But they begin to represent different things. So we start to see the gods evolving and representing characteristics and natural forces. Poseidon, the god of the sea. Zeus, the god of the sky. That sort of thing. And when we look at their family tree, well, it's more like a family bush. It's kind of tricky to keep track of everyone, especially as the names change from Greek to Roman. And then we have old spellings versus new spellings, etc. Our idea of religion is very different from theirs. Our idea would be regular worship and some kind of sacrifice. But the reality is very, very different. We would see, for example, in Athens, two religious festivals per year based on identity. So in other words, you're really worshiping the fact that you worship, or sorry, you're celebrating the fact that you worship Athena as an Athenian. And it's all about community identity. There are no morals and ethics here. Sacrifices and prayers are not as common as we tend to think beyond the simple household gods that you would worship on a daily basis. And when we start adding philosophy or morals and ethics to identity, we will get to what is modern day Christianity, but that won't happen until the Roman Empire. 
In terms of ancient Greece itself, here it is. It's really the Hellenic Peninsula. So it's this area right here, mostly to the south. So here we see Athens, Sparta, Corinth, Thebes. So it's really this very southern area. Why the southern area? Because it's the closest thing to agricultural land they have. They don't have a lot of it. By the time we get to around 550, Greece has colonies all over the place. And there are going to be reasons for that that we're going to get into a little bit more, mostly because Greece is horrible for agriculture. And when you have any peoples that come from a territory that is really horrible in terms of growing crops and everything else, what you get is a society that will start to rely on trade. They develop their navy, they develop ships so that they can trade throughout the Mediterranean. The only things they really are good at growing in Greece, there aren't too many things that grow on that rocky land, are going to be sheep and goats because they eat pretty much anything. And we're going to see olives because olive trees can grow in some pretty tough conditions. Greece is made up of independent city-states, so very, very similar to what we've seen in the past, although these are getting larger and much more powerful. There is no such thing as a Greek empire, for example. It is all a combination of culture, language, and religion that really draws them together. For the Greeks, the gods were human, but immortal. They have human flaws. We have... Hera being jealous of the fact that Zeus is constantly committing acts of adultery. We have Ares, who is always jealous of whoever is trying to get a little too close to Aphrodite. We have Apollo with his passions that tend to be rather overwhelming. We see Hades kidnapping people. You get the idea. These are very human figures. They have flaws. You couldn't imagine the same thing happening in Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt where the gods were idealized. They're taking on a different form. The stories of the gods become mythology, fables. They're ways to pass on taboos, mores, and lessons more so than to explain how the world works. The aim of the individual in Greece, primarily men in Greece, was to achieve a balance between the intellectual and physical disciplines. This is the ideal behind a humanistic education. The idea is Stephen Hawking's with an Amber Crombie body. Many ideas of Western culture would have their roots in ancient Greece. So what's happening between the Mycenaeans and ancient Greece? Well, we get a two to three hundred year period referred to as the Dark Ages, the Greek Dark Ages. Sometime in the late 10th century, there's a revival, and by the 8th century, by the 800s, it starts to pick up. And at that time, the 8th century, we see the creation of the Greek alphabet, uh, we see economic conditions improving, and we start to see population growth, which will bring us into our first